We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, but today doesn't feel that way. We are divided in more ways than one, and the media and the powers that be all have their own agenda. The people of this great nation no longer care about the truth, they only care about the side they are on. At Poor360, I am trying to change that. For bringing you the facts and history so we can all learn something and make our own decisions. Tune in every Tuesday to be a part of that journey. The following, the following. is a journey into comics. Journey into comics. A journey into comics. A journey into comics. Journey into comics. Journey into comics. Network. 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 Production. Production. Going forward in time to view alternate futures, to see all the possible outcomes of the coming conflict. How many did you see? 14,605. How many did we win? One. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Journey into Comics, the podcast that's dedicated to everything nerd. With your host, the podfather himself, Nate Phillips, and introducing his new co-host, Tyler McLaughlin. You should have gone for the head. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of Journey into Comics. It's JIC 252. I am your host, Nate, now in my black suit. That's a Spider-Man reference for those of you who get where that comes from. Today joining me, as always, my main man himself, welcome back to the podcast. Tyler, how's it going? It's good. You're in your black suit. I'm in my red suit, like Carnage, a little bit sunburnt. Oh. Why, why, how'd that happen? Uh, I've spent a lot of time at the pool the last two days. Nice. Poolside in the summertime. Mm-hmm. Feels good. You're not working your balls off every single day back to back to back to back to back. Yeah, it's all it's always nice to kind of get a reprieve from work. Do you have a pool or do you go to a family pool? Somebody has a pool? No. Um my our our daughter is in swim lessons currently and yes it's two days a week and yesterday morning um it runs from on Saturdays it goes from ten to ten thirty. And we went to breakfast yesterday yesterday morning and kind of had a, a nice, relaxing start to the day. And I was like, you know what we should do after we get done at the pool? We should just go to another pool. Because yes. Ruby's already in her swimsuit, and we can go. We don't have any plans the rest of the afternoon. Just go and relax and have a nice day. And we got there basically right when the pool opened, and we were there... Right around the time that, like, the massive influx of people came in. So it was, like, the perfect storm. We did the same thing again today. We went right when they opened and left right around the time that it got super crowded. So you avoid the rush? Mm Mm-hmm. That's great. They installed a new slide at this this pool that is, like, you get into, like, a... uh, like an ODST shit and drop pod. Fuck yes. And it's got a trap door. And you have like you have to cross your arms and your feet and put your head back against the slide and there's this robotic voice that goes three, two, one. And then fucking the floor drops out. Oh my god. I did that god. I did that enough times yesterday, I thought I was gonna have a fucking heart attack. Jesus. Because, like, I I would get off of it and then go right back up to the top. Like a kid in a candy store. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's... Found that shot of adrenaline. When when I was describing it to Skylar yesterday, she's like, you're being like a little fucking kid. And I was like, yes, because this is incredible, you know? Um, But there's so much G-force, you can't pick your head up off the back of the slide. Oh, my God. So it, it's so pretty you're incredible. Just locked in. Mm-hmm. Oh fuck! I, mean, I don't know about it, all that, my I, man. I think it. I think. I think right when you drop at one point, you're going like forty-five or fifty miles an hour. 
holy shit. Mm -hmm. And you're like straight down tubing? It goes straight down, and then it goes straight back up and loops and goes straight back down again. You fucking looped? Mm -hmm. I would have shit my drawers. You would have just seen Dude, it was <laughs> going around the loop. There would have just been drops of brown coming down, <laughs> you know? Like. Well, like, I got there yesterday, and I totally forgot that, that, they, um, that they renovated that pool. And I, you know, I was kind of sizing it up, and I was like, I'm just going to go do it. I didn't know anything about the slide other than looking at it. And I got to the top, and she's like, okay, step into the pod and do all this stuff. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like, you know, your heart's going because you look down, and the, the, the trap door is see-through. And it's oh, just shit. it's just pitch black below you. So oh my it, it God, was, dude. It was incredible. I would have shat all over. They would. Have... I told I told Skylar yesterday that 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 slide, like with the adrenaline and like you know, really, all the times that I rode it the last two days, I really didn't have to wait in line because a lot of people are afraid to do it. Oh yeah. Um, and then the anticipation, but, being in line, hearing other people's reactions can amplify it and make it a million times worse or better, depending on how, you know, your excitement builds. Well, and like I, t I told her yesterday that hearing that robotic voice do the countdown is almost worse than the actual drop because like the first couple of times I did it, I didn't really have it in sync yet. But there is when when the when the voice says three two one, there's a delay. Oh god! So it's like time almost freezes, and it's like when is this floor gonna go? And right right when in your mind you would say when is this gonna go? You just fucking plummet. Oh my! So god. Dude. It, I told her yesterday that I've been on a lot of roller coasters that weren't as fun as that slide. I'm an adrenaline junkie, so that's one of those things. Like you tell me that, and although I'm over here like I would shit, I'm also like, where is this located? So I may attempt to try it sometime. You know? Yeah, it's just right here in town. So if you and the girls come down before the summer's over, we'll have to go check it out. Sweet, that would be absolutely fantastic. So it's funny, you know, talking about. I was just watching videos the other day on YouTube of the this like slingshot ride that exists that they have at like the Indy Motor Speedway and some other places, right? So what it is is it's like this literal slingshot, and two people sit in this like thing together, and you get pulled slowly back, and then you get released, and you go fucking flying, and then you're boing and up and down for several minutes and you're like 300 and some odd feet in the air and whatnot P first of all people are so fucking cocky it makes me sick mm -hmm. because then they get put in their place and that makes me feel real good like fuck yeah that's funny because like there was this one girl she's like i'm fine it's nothing she's just like trying to no sell hardcore this is not going to do anything i don't even know why we're on this stupid ride you know just playing whatever. The guy's like, okay, do you guys want a countdown? The girls are like, yeah. So he's like, three, two, and pushes the fucking button before you hit one. And you hear nice. her go, Wah! and she just <laughs> takes off into the ether, you know. But they get about halfway up, and the G-forces are so powerful when it's launching you, this chick passes out. And she's completely dead bodied limp while this thing is happening and wakes up mid thing to screaming in midair because she's waking up in midair above the fucking city. It's like a nightmare. Yes. <laughs> oh, man, they're so and they're those those videos are also on Facebook too. It's like Daytona slingshot ride. Man, those things get me. Shit like that's funny as fuck, man. Um since I since you know, we last spoke. I helped my dad mostly finish my sister's bathroom, and I don't understand why shit just can't be easy when you're remodeling a house or doing any kind of project. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like that doesn't exist. Hey, we're just like my dad. When I when I was younger, I would always hear him like. 
hey, kid, we're just going to go change the transmission on the truck. Be like, oh, okay, we're just going to change the transmission. Cool. <clears throat> and then it's not that easy, and it's, like, really stressful. And then, like, it's we're just going to change a hanger on the truck. And then I get hit in the fucking head with a hanger that splits me open. That really happened. And I'm right. like, this isn't as easy, you know? So now we fast forward to where, like, I'm like, this isn't going to be easy. Like, I walked into Monday going, whatever we're about to do is going to be met with bullshit. <laughs> And it was some of the most comedic bullshit that I am so glad that I was not there alone. The girls got to come down as well, which was nice. My sister and young nephew were there. Of course, Sawyer probably doesn't know what Grandpa was screaming, but I do, and it's fucking hilarious, so we're going to talk about it. So we got the tub in. We finally get the piping to get the bathtub to where it'll drain, okay? Mm -hmm. And he goes, okay, Nate. Go upstairs, fill her up, and lock it in place so it can fill up. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I lock the thing in place. I start filling the water up. He goes, lock it in place. I like, I'm, I like, I did. He yells, lock it in place. I'm like, I did. It's filling up. He goes, okay. And then I hear him go, fuck, 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 fuck. No! And I'm like, what? He's like, the tub is cracked. And it's leaking water all over. Mm. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? And so he's coming upstairs, red-faced. He's screaming. He has officially lost chill. And he looks at the thing. Like, he takes a second before he officially, officially loses it. Because it was about to be really bad. We had mortared the tub in place. So it would be extra firm, right? So he goes and he looks at the drain and he realizes there's like a, a eighth of an inch gap where the drain actually connects to the tub. And he's like, you fucking kidding me? So he takes this thing and he tightens it up and it, it works. You know, that's cool and whatever. And then we had mm -hmm. to do some drywall work and whatever. We got that shit done, man. It was nice. And then it was cool because he uh, yesterday actually came up and visited us, which happens like once a year. It's kind of a rare occurrence, which... <clears throat> I wake up at like 9.30, he texts me, he's like, hey, my back feels like shit today, I'm not going to come up. I was like, okay, I'm getting ready to go back to sleep, sleep like another like 20 minutes or something. Before I can even fully go to sleep, my phone is just like blowing up, and it's him messaging me, and then he's calling me, he's like, I'm trying to call you, and I'm like, looking at my phone, I'm like, I can't even fucking hardly see this phone, what the fuck, so I answer it, and you know, and he's like, I just got out of the shower. I think I'm coming up. I was like, fuck. Okay. Now I got to jump in to get the things I meant to get done done really fast because I only got this little two hour window. So it was like I ran out, mowed my yard, fucking finished up the little bit of inside housework, got everything like tidied up. Wanted to look extra nice, especially how he criticizes my sister every time he walks into her house. I'm like, you're not walking into my house and talking shit, motherfucker. Not today, Satan. You know? Not today. <laughs> so, yeah, man, other than that, not too much. <clears throat> uh, been going on with me. Debuted a new podcast on the network with Brando. That was pretty cool. It's nice to have him back. Man, is it ever? It's like uh it's like LeBron when he went to the Heat and then he came back to Cleveland. We got our we got our LeBron back in Cleveland. I know that's not really a great reference, but like Jordan did never leave the Bulls, so Well, I mean he did. Well, I mean after the fact, he never went back, is what I'm saying. He left the Bulls yeah. in his prime and then became an old man on the Wizards and showed that he mm -hmm. kind of had it, but not as much. Not as much. Anyways, man, you want to get this show started? We've been uh, bullshitting here for a little bit, man. Let's uh, do it. Cool. Where do you want to start today? What do we want to get into? Let's start with the some DC news. Sure, bring it on. Where do we go? Uh, <clears throat> I've I've got um, a couple different things. I think I've got, I think we've got mirror images of of kind of the positive and negative of a character. Um, 
on comicbook.com, I've got a headline here. John Car- John Carpenter joins DC Universe to co-write Joker Year of the Villain, which I think is really, really cool. Yeah. You've got you've got one of the greatest horror icons <laughs> ever in John Carpenter with one of the most like just one of the best villains in all of comic book and storytelling ever in the Joker. I think that'll be a really good uh, kind of collaboration. So I absolutely I'm excited agree. about that. You've got a little bit of negative. Man, you know, let me just say the AP blew us up with this negative news. Mm-hmm. And honestly, okay, so here, it's this one move, which we're going to talk about in a second, but I'm going to hype it a little bit because I want people to understand that what I'm saying isn't coupled with expectations of the film before it's on or anything. This is a symptom of a much larger issue at DC and Warner Brothers, Warner Media and whatnot. For them to say, uh, hey, Todd Phillips, we want you to come in and do a Joker movie. And we want you to have Joaquin Phoenix and all the money that you need, and you're going to make this awesome movie. And he's like, awesome. And they're like, okay, Todd, what source material are you using? And he's like, source material? I'm not using source material. I'm just going to tell the story of a guy that I think is how the Joker came about. And it's my story. I don't give a fuck about source material. Come on, man. That is so... That's why these movies are failing. Because no one at DC gives a shit to go, wait a minute, hold on. Like, they're not smart enough, they don't care enough, or they're not clever enough. It's one of those three things, or maybe a combination of the three, that lead us to where we are. And and to briefly, before we get too far away from it, touch on... I think John Carpenter working with them on Joker, You're the Villain, is great. Uh, I can't wait to see what that book does and see how it does. And um, I'm sure we'll be some of the first people reading it and talking about it when it does finally drop. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely back... going to pick it up. Oh, absolutely. Not, not, just be, not just because I'm a fan of the Joker, but almost more than that, I'm a fan of John Carpenter. So I, this is a mashup that I'm really, really excited to see he kind of play out. Hell Yeah. Maybe there'll be a uh, snake pliskin Easter egg in the, in the <laughs> series at some point, you know, the eye yeah. patch or something. Uh, but uh, as far as this Todd Phillips, the Joker movie, it's kind of sad because you look at the footage and the trailers and I'm like, this could be really good. Like this could actually do cool things and people could be into it. But you mm-hmm. lose me as a comic fan the minute you say... I didn't stay true to the comics. I didn't care about the comics. I didn't even consider the comics. Because it's what it's supposed to be about. The reason I go to these movies is to see things I love adapted. And the concepts that I've read and hoped to see fully actualized. Actualized on a big screen. That's why all these different Marvel movies do it so well. Because maybe they don't take every single thing from one singular book and do it exact. But they take all the best stuff and then they take stuff that, you know, like you look at Mysterio and they said, hey, here's this guy, he's an amazing Spider-Man character, but how can we make him an amazing Spider-Man character in the MCU? We tie him back to Tony. How do we tie him back to Tony? We say that he created Barf. That's how Barf is how Mysterio creates his illusion. It just... That's genius storytelling just by sitting there and trying to figure out how you would even connect the blocks. DC mm-hmm. doesn't do that. And that's and, and, and that's why I'm saying this is a problem that's a, it's a small part of a much larger issue at hand here. Giving the Absolutely. reins to people that just don't give a fuck, man. What are your thoughts on this thing? Well, I'm going to add a little bit to what you said. It's it's not even just the the characters or the the stories that we've we've read and or seen in the past adapted and it's almost I think a lot of times especially where we're at in in 
storytelling, in just media today, it, we want to see certain directors put their spin on certain characters or certain stories in those that we've enjoyed, they've always either taken a lot of inspiration from source material or they've stayed very true to the source material. You know, Mysterio is the perfect example. The way that they wrote him into the modern MCU was just flawless. You know, the the casting as of, of Jake Gyllenhaal was superb. And then everything that that built up to the the climatic or climactic ending of that film was just incredible, you know. I I said on the episode last week that at one point they they totally um, Mysterio had me sold on the illusion that he was actually a good guy, you know. That yeah. that's flawless storytelling, <clears throat> and I was really excited to see. See a standalone Joker movie with Joaquin Phoenix as the main character because I think he's one of the more underappreciated actors in Hollywood. He gets very, very involved in his characters, and I thought that if we were going to get a solo Joker movie, that this was going to be the one for Warner Brothers Media and DC to really be it. And after seeing the trailer, you know... You and I and, and pretty much everybody on the network at, at some point in the last two years has talked about how we can't really put a lot of faith in movie trailers because you're either going to see all the important stuff from the movie or you're going to see a lot of misdirection and stuff that doesn't actually make it into the film. And, you know, I remember talking about the trailer after it dropped and you and you and I and AP and Blaine were all just kind of like, <clears throat> bleh. Yeah, it just you like know. it didn't scream the Joker to me. Mm -hmm. And you know what one thing and that really kills me is is that the colors are so muted. That's mm -hmm. not the Joker. The Joker is not a muted character. Come on. And I I think for for a lot of directors like you and I obviously kind of and it's not even kind of you and I understand the Joker as a character. Most fans, most DC fans understand what that character is, what he means to kind of the universe, the, the, how do I phrase mm -hmm. it? Any of the stories that take place that the Joker is involved in, he is one of the most important characters no matter what. Even because if he has an he, entirely tiny role. Mm -hmm. Because of who he is as a character and what he's able to do with or without resources and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You look at, or w when you hear that it's just, it's my movie, I, I didn't look at any source material at all, and it's like, okay, um, why would you do that? And, and furthermore, why would DC allow them to do that? I don't know, man. I think this is a giant misstep. And I want to make sure we're absolutely quoting Todd Phillips' quote here. Some people don't, you know, some people might say, what did he say exactly? Here's his exact quote from the, the man's mouth himself from an Empire uh, interview that he did. We didn't follow anything from the comic books, which people are going to be mad about. We just wrote our version of where a guy like Joker might come from. That's what was interesting to me. We're not even doing Joker, but the story of becoming Joker. It's about this man. That's like that's pretty weird. It's kind of like just a big waste of time. Yeah, it's like, hey, um, so, hey, Tyler, uh, I know you're a humongous fan of the Incredible Hulk. And I mm -hmm. think he's a great character. I think he's spectacular. Uh, he's incredible, some might even say. Um, <clears throat> you know, I like all this stuff about his backstory and whatnot, but what if we just write a story about a scientist who's just like a guy and then, like, f make him turn green for some reason? Like, he just turns green. He doesn't even have any super strength or rage. Sure. Yeah, that sounds cool. Or People would be into that. Like in vulnerability, he just like he literally just turns green. He's the green turd, <laughs> mm -hmm. fresh and out like, of the baby diaper. 
the CGI is going to be really shoddy, so he looks more like a Ninja Turtle than, than the Incredible Hulk. And his mouth also won't move. Yes. Sign me up. Okay, cool. So I'm glad we're in agreement. Well, that's Nate Phillips' version of a, of a Marvel movie done in Todd Phillips' style of the Joker. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I don't, I don't get it, like, at all. I, I mean, think it's I, somebody I, I really, taking... Go ahead, go ahead. I, I really, really understand <clears throat> a director or, or a director and producer wanting to put their artistic vision on a character or a story or a group of characters. But we've said it many times on the show and many times across the network, you have to look at the source material. If, if you want to do a character piece, do a character piece. You can't call an Incredible Hulk movie The Incredible Hulk if it has nothing to do with The Incredible Hulk. Absolutely. That would be like trying to do a documentary about a person and not learning anything about the person and just going, well, I mean, maybe I'll figure out how their life story went. Yeah. No. I mean, like like you pick up a book and you're like, okay, I'm going to read <sighs> I'm going to read this biography on Ronald Reagan. And the whole book is literally about Lyndon B. Johnson. <laughs> like that's I, is this a misprint? Did I get the wrong book? Did someone switch you know, covers like, on me when I did those mushrooms? Yeah, like it's just it, you 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 put it perfectly. It's a huge misstep. It's it's a huge misstep continuing the trend of huge missteps from Warner Brothers and DC. And I I'm almost of the opinion now that I think that they are trying to tank the ship. They are steering the Titanic towards the iceberg just so they don't have to do it anymore. Yeah, just to watch. Like, they feel if they can fully show that their movies are shit and that... You know, I'm glad you brought that up because to speak on self-sabotage, which is something I firmly believe they have done. They've taken movies that were done and had people giving positive reviews and said... You know, we don't like them, and uh, you should probably change everything about your movie so it's nothing like the movie you made. And then they mm -hmm. get mad when they don't make money or do well at the box office or do well with the fans and the critical response. It's like, get with the times, man. And here's a, here's a very direct example of that as we sit here discussing some DC news. And, you know, listen, somebody on the network, when he gets back from Africa, is going to be on our balls about writing DC's balls and being hard on them. But listen, AP, in all fairness, I have some good stuff to say about DC today, too. So it's we're, we're balancing this shit out now. So the next big movie that people are anticipating is uh, the Margot Robbie Birds of Prey flick and the fantabulous mm -hmm. eman emancipation of one Harley Quinn. Tons of amazing people are in that movie. Uh, it's not due in theaters till early next year, but it sounds like the upcoming film might have hit a bit of a snag, at least in terms of how it's being received. Um, test screenings of Birds of Prey reportedly has audiences and Warner Brothers execs split in their thoughts on the film. On Twitter, Screen Rant Stephen Colbert noted on Saturday that the audience test screening of the Margot Robbie starring film had people raving about it. But the same could not be said for the internal Warner Bros. test screening. Apparently, the execs had the exact opposite reaction to the film. So will we see, I'm curious to get your opinion of this, are we going to see them yet again ship divert into the iceberg? Are we going to see them self-sabotage, force them to change the whole movie at the last minute, force reshoots, and then wonder why it becomes a steaming pile of shit. Uh, I, I mean, I, I would say it, it's very, very likely. I mean, you look at, and this, and this is what's sad. You look at a movie like Solo, which eighty-five to ninety percent of the movie was reshot. That's okay. crazy. Disney and Star Wars, Lucasfilm complains that that movie is a big turd. Well, if you wouldn't have had to have reshot the movie, it probably would have done pretty well at the box office because what it did do 
was decent. It just didn't over over um, it didn't overtake the cost of the reshoots. So a lot of those Warner Brothers movies that that you and I have had pretty mixed reviews of. You know, I like the Man of or the I like the Superman movies a little bit more than you do, but I know there were reshoots for some of those. Yeah. Um. You know what movie I fucking loved that DC did? Justice League? No. Well, I mean, I thought Justice League was all right. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to dog on Justice League. I thought that was an all right movie. But I loved Shazam, dude. I just watched it. I don't know if we talked about that last week or not. Did I bring that up? Mm-mm. Yeah, uh, man. I think you I think you said that you watched it, but I don't think we talked about it very much. Dude, it's such a good movie. Like, it's it's what I wanted. When I saw that trailer, I had an expectation in my head of what I wanted the movie to be. That's what the movie delivers. And I'm like, oh, fuck yes. Here we go. A movie that actually, like, lived up to its promise. It was good. Funny. Uh, had me literally locked in. Once I started watching the movie, I couldn't look away. I mean, not not often do movies do that in the DC realm for me. I mean, a lot of times I'm just like, fuck, when do I get to check my phone? Like, when's the lull when Lois Lane's going to come in and have a 45-minute fucking diatribe about, you know, why the world needs Superman? Mm-hmm. Here it comes. Okay, time to get my phone out, you know. But there was none of that. And I mean, and, and there, I mean, there, there's cleverness. There's an amazing cameo at the end that's mind-blowing. Like, they, they did so many things with Shazam. I was very thoroughly impressed i'll end on that and it's like i don't know why they can't do that so well let me ask you this do you sure. think well we're talking about dc and, and self-sabotage you know dc has kind of said that they don't want to do like a connected cinematic universe that they want to they want to proceed with these standalone films you know, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These ensemble films like Suicide Squad and Birds of Prey and Justice League, you know, you look at the extended cut of Suicide Squad, it's actually a pretty decent movie. Are some of the characters over the top and, and, and some of the plot awful? Absolutely. But it's a pretty entertaining movie, I mean, if you compare it to Guardians of the Galaxy, obviously it's shit. But if you didn't have Guardians to compare it to, it would be a pretty decent movie. I think yeah, and that... I mean, there, and there are ahead. things too, man. Sorry not to cut you off, but to quickly touch on that, there are things about that movie that were really good. There are parts of Suicide Squad that are really good. So... I don't know, man. I... I think we're almost at the point now where we get, we literally can't even compare DC and Marvel in the movie verse mm-hmm. anymore because they're not even remotely they're not in the same sport anymore, dude. They're not the same mm-hmm. sport. It's yep. comparing I, I the totally fucking agree with that. Bulls. It's like comp- it's like saying who's the better team, the Bulls or the fucking Blackhawks. Put them on the ice and let's find out. Mm-hmm. We're gonna put them on an, on the ice with a basketball, and <laughs> let's find out. You know, like it doesn't yeah. make any goddamn sense. But I think what I was getting to was I I think that they might be sabotaging the these projects that they have in preparation for James Gunn's Suicide Squad Squad project to be the one that really hits home for everybody. When in reality, they, they've already had that in Wonder Woman and Shazam. And they, and I'm not going to lie, listen, even to some extent, Aquaman, you, a lot of you guys really liked it. I didn't, it didn't hit me the same as other people, but to be fair, I need to give it another rewatch. So, you know, undecided at this point for me. But uh, my thing about the James Gunn thing is, there's a rumor going around that he's going to be like the head man, like the Feige guy going forward for DC that's going to try to help rebuild their universe. How would that work with him continuing to direct movies for Disney? Well, I think that he wouldn't 
and I think that's where we're going to have... At some point, there's going to be a conflict of interest, and Disney's either going to offer him a fuck ton of money, or DC's going to offer him a fuck ton of money. But here's the thing I'm worried about, and I mean, as of right now, we're still talking... We haven't even got an official cast for the Suicide Squad movie with James Gunn yet. You know, we've got a lot of rumors of what... A couple people, I think Idris Elba has has been cast, but like the whole cast hasn't been laid out yet. Mm-hmm. So they haven't even fucking started filming. It's possible that if it came down to it, Marvel could be like, "Look, James, we'll offer you X amount, but you can't do that movie." And then miraculously, James Gunn steps down from Suicide Squad, and that's it, dude. Isn't if that he... happens, fatal blow. It... Isn't he bound by contract, though, to, to do this movie for Warner Brothers? But, I mean, even bound by contract, those contracts come down to, like, how the pay grade works and a payback scale. James Gunn has the money to fucking give them money for not doing it. And, I mean, you have all kinds of directors that leave projects all the time. Colin Trevorrow left uh, Star Wars Episode Nine, as did uh, Chris Lord and um, Phil Miller, Phil, Mil- Phil Lord mm-hmm. and Chris Miller, whatever those guys' names, yes. when uh, Solo. So, I mean, and, 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 and those guys are more fired. But, you know, people leave projects all the time, willingly or unwillingly, and maybe James Gunn's got to decide, like, does the future of the MCU's cosmic universe really tip in my scales? And is that the cash cow? Or can I take something that I have full control to rebuild from and start from scratch and hope that it's a hit? That's a lot of pressure, too. You know? I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's hard to decide. I don't know what I would do as James Gunn. It, well, I I really hope that there could be a happy medium where... James Gunn is allowed to continue to direct movies for Disney, but he is basically a studio head for for Warner Brothers, where he doesn't directly get involved. He just puts the pieces together and allows them to do their thing. Like, hey, I would do this, and I would do it this way, and I would do it this way with these people, and I would do it this way with these people on that set, go. That way, that way he is basically a consultant, and then it's not a conflict of interest issue because he's on Disney's payroll as a director. He's on Warner Brothers' payroll as a consultant. Yeah, I like that, man. I like that a whole hell of a lot uh, uh, because it would allow him to utilize his talents and it, it would be more fair. It would be really fair and fucking cool to have James Gunn be able to offer. Like, if it was James Gunn that would have had the helm all the way back at Man of Steel instead of Zack Snyder, we could be totally talking about a totally different DCEU experience. Mm -hmm. It could be even better than Marvel. We could be raving about how it's putting Marvel to shame. I can't believe. But it's not. That's not the story we got. We got the Zack Snyder cut. And I'm curious to know, speaking of the Zack Snyder cut, do you think we will ever see his version of Justice League? I I, I can't say one way or the other if, if, I, if I think that we are going to see it. I really hope that we do. Well, here's the thing, man. There's actually a letter writing campaign where people are going to be writing in at an official address that's going to be posted on this official Twitter that they're asking people to handwrite letters in to help release the Snyder Cut, uh, especially now with the most recent announcement. I don't know if you saw Warner Media made the announcement this week. They will be rolling out their streaming service, HBO Max. Mm-hmm. Um, and people are like, well, if you have HBO Max, like, just put it there. We'll fucking watch it there. That'd be cool. You don't even have to give me a Blu-ray of it. I just want to see a version of it. Like, you've got mm-hmm. people clamoring for it, man. I wouldn't mind seeing it. You know, if it's that much different, if it's going to be that different of a film, I don't mind seeing it. But I liked the version of Justice League we got. I didn't hate it. You know? I didn't either. I, th- I, I, I think we agreed kind of unanimously that it was every bit as good as the 2012 Avengers film. Absolutely. It did it for me. It had all the moving parts that you need. It was a great ensemble. 
Jason Momoa and Ezra Miller kill it, respectively, in that movie. And going into that film, I was really, really weary about Ezra Miller. I'm not a big Ezra Miller guy. I I did not like his casting as The Flash, and I I really, really dug it, you know, towards the end. I think we that's another thing we definitely agreed on uh, when it comes to that, man. But, no, you know, I don't know. I don't... You look at the way Marvel works, you look at the way DC works, and you look at it across the board. The fact that DC even has a possible Snyder cut just shows kind of what shape they're in. Marvel has never had to go... Listen, we're going to release the Shane Black cut of Iron Man 3 to make you guys like the movie more. No, Iron Man 3 is fucking Iron Man 3. It's a good movie for what it is, for what it does to the story when you look at it now as a whole, looking at the bigger picture. See, that's the thing Marvel did a really great job of. Sometimes the chapter seemed slow, but that did not mean the book was bad, you know? Right. Um, and speaking of Marvel and their chapters being good or bad or indifferent, we have some numbers, dude. Mm-hmm. Do you want to bring up the numbers, or do you want me to throw out these numbers? What kind of numbers do you want to talk? Oh, I, I can I can take this one. Uh, Avengers Endgame takes big jump in catching Avatar, less than eight million away. Uh, blah blah blah. Avengers Endgame earned another 2.8 million at the box office this weekend, bringing its worldwide box office total to 2.78 billion. That puts uh, the box office behemoth a mere 8 million shy of tying Avatar's 2.788 billion box office record. So they're they're really really close. They are on the door knocking, and you know every time that you get the update that they're close. There's a bigger surge. And mm-hmm. and as they get close, like now, honestly, man, I'm like, what the fuck do I got going on this week? Maybe I can catch Avengers Endgame one time in theaters before it's gone. You know, like, really? I kind of want to. Of course, I don't know if I would want to stay for all that bullshit footage at the end. Just saying. But I also kind of want to go see Endgame and then immediately go see Far From Home. Mm-hmm. And that's slaying at the box office as well, dude. Domestically, it's almost brought in a billion dollars. It's at like eight hundred million, or not domestically, worldwide. Sorry, domestically, it's brought in almost three hundred million. Yeah, in in Far From Home's second weekend, it's up to two hundred and seventy four million domestically. That's crazy, man. And uh, it's like the fourth uh, highest grossing movie of twenty nineteen. Behind Endgame, Captain Marvel, and the Aladdin live-action movie. Mm-hmm. Toy Story trails in fifth behind Far From Home. Far From Home is doing better than Toy Story, bro. I feel like That's Disney good. thought, oh, Toy Story is going to be a knock it out of the park guaranteed home run. And it's doing well. I mean, you saw it in theaters. I did not. I'm not going to give them my money to be in a cry fest. It's not my M.O. <laughs> um, but... Far from home beating out Toy Story kind of says like we're in the era where superhero fatigue I don't think is really a thing unless you are worn out because of a person's views on superhero movies like you listen to somebody rambling about the same shit over and over and over again like us and then you're like fuck mm-hmm. I'm over superheroes you know I hope we don't do that to people but like superhero movies are just hot now man they're in they're good. They're locked in place, as it were. So, Tyler, I want to say this. We've got uh, Spider-Man Far From Home's official number is uh, $847,029,305 that it's brought home so far. It's only been out for two weekends, man. So once it has Mm -hmm. a a decently long run, I do see this being another billion-dollar baby for Marvel. They, uh, They just got it, man. And uh, I, I look at Marvel, and I got to ask you, you know, and I don't think we've talked about it yet. Marvel is going to be at both D23, that's Disney's special spectacular presentation event type thing. Marvel is also returning to Hall H, San Diego Comic-Con, 
5.15 prime time slot with some really long panels. What do you think is going to be revealed? What are, I mean, obviously you got to believe they're going to lay their dicks out on the table and fully reveal the next phase through maybe the next two phases. Who knows? But maybe the five-year plan gets put in front of us. What do you think? Man, I, I, I think... I think there's two ways to look at it. I think if they lay the roadmap out, I don't I don't see them doing multiple phases at a time, kind of like they did, you know, four or five years ago. Um, but I can definitely see them saying, okay, here's our roadmap for this phase. Here's a bunch of the Black Widow movie. Enjoy it. And on the flip side of that, like you said, they just go all in and say, kind of like Tony Stark in the first Iron Man when he's holding his arms out, you know, like, look at all this shit. Yeah, like, look at all my cool stuff, like, uh, what's that guy's name? I can't think of his fucking name. Scourge in Thor Ragnarok. Mm -hmm. Look at all my stuff. I pulled these out of a place on Midgard called Texas. I call it Des and Troy. Because you see, when you put them together, they destroy. I love that line so much. Um, my thought is this, man. Okay, so we've had speculation. I'm so glad you brought up the Black Widow movie thing. Because somebody straight up asked, like, when are we going to get the official announcement on Black Widow movie? And Kevin Feige's like, that's not a thing. And then he even addressed, he's like, sure, you might have seen Scarlett Johansson on set doing something, but that doesn't necessarily mean it is what you think it is. What if all these quasi-announcements, all these, we're getting an Eternals movie and we're getting a Black Widow movie, what if they were really red herrings because they were keeping us so far off the scent that when they reveal, it's going to be like, holy shit, because I, I'm not trying to be an asshole. I don't want you to, when I say this, I don't want you guys to think that I'm like, have a grim outlook on the future of the MCU. But I'm not going to lie, when you tell me the first two movies of the next phase are Black Widow and The Eternals, my hard chubby that was very stiff from Far From Home and how Endgame happened immediately has shriveled inside of itself. Because I'm like... the. You're bringing us Black Widow and the Eternals. There are so many other characters we could pull out of the vault. There are so many other cool things you could do. There are so many other characters that had Phase 1 through 3 movies that you're not giving sequels that we don't know about immediately. Like, how the fuck are we not talking about Doctor Strange 2 as an official guaranteed movie that's happening right now? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, that's the thing yeah. that gets me thinking... Maybe they're just going to pull one over on us and say that there's all these movies coming. But really, when they give us the lineup here in like just over two weeks now, man, we're really close, the end of July, uh, to finding out what really lies in Marvel's plans. I don't know. Well, and I, I totally agree. We, we've talked about the Black Widow film on the show a couple times. And, I mean, the more we talk about it, the more, the more it just doesn't make sense to me. Scarlett Johansson and Black Widow had their moment in Infinity War and Endgame. That we need to move on from that character. If there's cool characters that you want to introduce moving forward, whether it's supporting hero characters or main hero characters or villains, and you want Black Widow to be involved in that, fine. Make it a, a, like a pseudo-ensemble cast and have Scarlett Johansson or whoever you cast as young Black Widow... Make a cameo appearance. Don't, yes. don't give us a bullshit Black Widow movie that no one realistically wants to watch. And and then and that's not me saying it negatively because I dislike the character or because I dislike Scarlett Johansson. It's just there's not really a whole lot that you can do for me with a Black Widow movie that's really going to get me amped up. No. And I mean, and that's another thing I think we've talked about it a little bit of like it would be really more interesting to me if, kind of like you said, Scarlett Johansson maybe isn't the star of the Black Widow movie, 
Maybe she makes a cameo appearance, and it's actually the story of her handing the mantle over in a situation that was like, listen, so-and-so, Yelena or whoever, if ever I were to die, you need to take up the mantle of the widow, dot, 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 you know? And then in doing that, you can have a movie where that person is kind of getting the torch. This is all, I mean, Anthony Mackie being Captain America, all these characters are going to have the torch passed. We need to see that. That's important. It's important in the history that any of the characters that are gone that have handed something down, we saw it with Tony handing Edith down to Parker and that Mm -hmm. being kind of like a lesson to Peter and an ultimate learning lesson. Like, also it leaves a question of, does Tony not know about Skrull? Like, does his glass, like, do those, were those glasses able to detect, you think? I don't think so. Okay. I don't know. I just think that it, it's integral to their storytelling for us to see, uh, you know, Anthony Mackie. We saw him get the mantle passed down from Cap, but we need to see him kind of earn his place as Cap. So mm-hmm. to have another rehash story of Black Widow, like you said, she had her day in the sun. She had her day on Vormir, as it were. Um and I don't want any, I don't need any more of it, but I mean, if we see a trailer and it's bomb as fuck, I guess I'll say I'll see it. Well, let me ask you this. What would you rather see? Sure. Would you rather see a Black Widow standalone film or a S.H.I.E.L.D. movie? Ooh, what era of S.H.I.E.L.D. are we talking about? Any any era of, era of S.H.I.E.L.D. Oh, see, that's vast, because with any era of S.H.I.E.L.D., you can tell any era of, I mean, literally opening that door opens up possibilities to having pre-Fury S.H.I.E.L.D. and that transition showing the roots of where Hydra actually first infiltrated. There has to be one, you know, when you look at it, there had to be one Hydra agent that got in first. That would be a cool story. And how he convinced someone else to hail Hydra. And then how that person, then you know, and how it spreads. Like, that would be super bomb. See, there's so much depth to that. But to talk about... We already know a lot about Scarlett Johansson's backstory. I mean, maybe we don't know the Budapest story that her and um, Hawkeye always reference. But do we need it? Can't we just let that memory be something that's sacred between those two? Mm-hmm. Do we do exactly. we do we need to have the door cracked open on all these things? And that's again why I'm going to just say it, man. I'm hopeful that they've bamboozled people and they've got people thinking there's a Black Widow movie and there's not going to be. Well, and I'm, I I saw this headline just now on comicbook.com. Captain America Civil War star reveals he has 5 movies left on his contract. We might not have seen the last of Crossbones after Maul. Promoting his new Netflix film, Point Blank, Captain America Civil War star Frank Grillo tells ComicBook.com he has five movies left on his contract with Marvel Studios. Though exact details weren't shared, Grillo did admit, should Marvel come calling, he'd be obligated to appear as Brock Rumlow or Crossbones upwards of five more times. He says, you know what? I got five more movies that I'm obligated to do for Marvel if they ever call me. So who knows, man? Um, hmm. I saw that, and then that's that's kind of what me got me going on the Shield Hydra thing. It, it's kind of it's kind of like Star Wars. You can just pick any point in time and tell a fantastic story with depth and meaning and. You can write in any relevant character or any character that you want to make relevant going forward with no effort whatsoever. Absolutely. You just have to be able to weave a good story, man. Mm-hmm. And, and another thing is, if you're great at storytelling, like, honestly, look at Solo at this. They pull off a movie that's set before the events of some of the best movies They tell their own story. It's unique to itself. But they also have sprinkles of the prequel trilogy, the OG trilogy, and the future moving on. Mm -hmm. 
all in one fell fucking swoop, man. That's good storytelling. I mean, even if it's not the most well received Star Wars flick, uh, I want to say that you know we had something interesting be said by Amy Pascal. Do you know who that is? Mm-hmm. She's a chick from Sony that kind of has. She's essentially the one that works hand in hand with Kevin Feige. Well. Apparently, she did this interview, and they asked her a bunch of different questions. And one of the questions was, is there a universe, or or something about, um, is Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire's universes connected to the MCU? And do you know what her response was? No. It's all connected. So, Hell yeah. that coupled with the Tom Holland thing, what if we're going to get a live action into the Spider-Verse told differently, where we're using the live action versions of those heroes so it all makes sense, and then, I'm not even going to lie, bro, you kill off Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man and Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, and you make the most emotionally painful moment for Tom Holland, because now... More than losing Tony Stark, him losing essentially versions of himself. Mm -hmm. Because they're all going to have so many similar traits, and that's going to be a funny thing if that were to actually happen. They could play off each other. But it's possible that Into the Spider-Verse could have a crossover somehow. They could animate a character into a movie that's never been done before. Uh, And speaking of that, Kevin Feige said the next Spider-Man movie will do something no movie has ever done before, and that's a guarantee. When you hear Kevin Feige say it, you're like, well, he's got me there. If he says it, it must be true. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, I I think if you look at the MCU as a whole right now, I think Spider-Man is kind of the crown jewel. And, you know, I've got a a list pulled up right now that says the 10 best Spider-Man villains who still need a live-action adaptation. And we talked about that a little bit last week, and a lot of those characters we talked about are on that list. I think, you know, if they do an Into the Spider-Verse live-action adaptation, that's top-tier material. Anyone that has seen... Sorry, I got some dog barking action. It's okay. Anyone that has seen um, last year's Into the Spider-Verse knows how good of a movie that is, and anyone that hasn't seen it, still knows how good of a movie it is because everyone who has seen it talks about it. And, you know, as as a Spider-Man fan, we all have our favorites. I don't know that anyone has Andrew Garfield as as, as their favorite, but... Um, I will Tom say I, I, I do a little bit because one thing that we got with Andrew Garfield that makes my life, and Tyler, as you're sitting here, I don't know if you, you'll be able to see this, but let me... Uh, while I keep the mic on here, uh, there's a poster, or it's not a poster, but it's a, uh, do you see it up above my lamp? Can you see it at all that Mm -hmm. well? Okay, so that's the cover for Amazing Spider-Man 122, which was the second half of the death of Gwen Stacy. 121 is like one of the most emotional comic books you ever read, because it's just the way they do it, it's so dark and brutal. They 100% nail it in that movie. And that's why I give Andrew Garfield some props. The death of Gwen Stacy, the way they did it in Amazing Spider-Man 2, the way they featured Green Goblin and Electro as the villains, kudos to them. Like, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. But uh, let's let's hear this list, man. What are the ten they say need a movie adaptation? Okay, number one is Craven the Hunter. I think we can definitely agree agree on that. Fuck yes, and I'm uh, no, almost certain he will be the next villain. Number two is Chameleon, one that I wanted to talk about last week, but my total brain lapse just shut down. I could not think. Um, I could not think of of Chameleon's name. Dimitri. Mm-hmm. Interesting so, that there was a guy. And far from home, whose name was Dimitri. Mm-hmm. 
I think it, I think if you if you did Craven, I think it would be really really neat to do a Craven and Chameleon at the same time, have a multi villain film since Craven and um, Chameleon are actually related. You know. Oh my God! So I'm gonna blow your brain hole. With what we have in the MCU with Skrull, what if Chameleon is actually a Skrull but says he has face changing technology? But Dude. never changes in front of anybody, you know? Like he never he never he's like, Look, I have to get into the zone and do it by myself, like I can't do it in front of people, you know. I'm sold. That'd be fucked up. That's a way to do it that's unexpected. You mm-hmm. know? Then when they kill him, it's and, revealed he was a scroll the whole time. You're like, oh, shit, I forgot the scroll can do that, you motherfuckers. In this little block, it says, Craven's half-brother is one of Spider-Man's two oldest supervillains and has been an integral part of many anti-Spidey plots. He would make for a great secondary villain for Craven or a mastermind of his own conspiracy or conspiracy. There's a chance that Chameleon has already been included in Spider-Man Far From Home, given the aptly named inclusion of the new S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, Dimitri. However, just like Spider-Man much of the time, we still aren't sure whether or not we've seen the Chameleon. Oh, I dig it. That's totally dig excellent. It. So far, the list is two for two. Chameleon first appears in uh, Amazing Spider-Man number one. He's the first... Spider-Man villain, did you know? Uh, Amazing Craven, Spider-Man Volume 1, Number 15. Craven the Hunter. Mm-hmm. Chameleon first appeared in Number 1, though, I'm pretty sure. Yep, Number yep. 1. Uh, uh, next. Go ahead. At Number 3, say next. we've got Prowler. Fuck yeah, Aaron Davis. And we've already been introduced to him. Childish Gambino is Aaron Davis. Mm-hmm. The Dong Lover. Uh, number four, we've got Jackal. Jackal would be sweet because it would actually set up Ben Riley and the Clone mm-hmm. Saga. So yeah. having Jackal in the universe would be cool. Of course, that's a little bit strange because uh, Ned Leeds is a character in that story arc, so they would have to change him because Ned Leeds exists as Parker's best friend. So right. the Jackal story would be altered significantly, but that's okay if it's done with purpose, as we've learned. Number five, we've got the Spider Slayers. Ooh, Alistar Smythe and the Spider Slayers. And that would lead into, if you did Smythe and the Spider Slayers, which could be somebody who J. Jonah Jameson, say, is a friend of, who's like, I've got a way to beat Spider-Man, you know, now that we're hunting him, because everyone knows that Parker is Mm -hmm. Spider-Man. Alistar Smythe would also do what? Give us the reason to officially utilize that guy from Breaking Bad, who's in jail with Michael Keaton, who is the Scorpion, Mac Mm -hmm. Gargan. And that's... That's who we've got at number six, which is one of my most wanted characters in Spider-Man. Fuck yes, I agree number, with you. Number seven, we've got Tombstone, which you and I talked about a lot last week. We would love to have Tombstone on the big screen. Number eight is Mr. Negative. No. Number I'm nine actually is the say, Sinister Six. I'm gonna, hold on, before we talk about Sinister Six, I need to say no to Mr. Negative. And here's why. why. We just had him in the game. He was done okay. so well in the game. The story was told really brilliantly. They took the source material. They accurately portrayed it. While it would be spectacular to see that done in the MCU at some point, there are other things that need to be done first before we ever consider Mrs. Mr. Sinister, or uh, Mr. Negative, sorry. Um, and if you're going to use Mr. Negative anyways, you you don't you use him for like into the Spider-Verse where his power is going to actually make sense and work when cuz doing so much CGI is going to lose people and his right. character is heavily CGI'd. So that being considered, I don't think Mr. Negative is the is 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 deserving to be on that list. There are others that I could think to possibly put on there go on let's see who else is on here 
Number nine is the Sinister Six. I think we can both agree. Multiple mm-hmm. reasons why, yeah. Number 10 is probably my top, one of my top favorites on this list, Doctor Doom. Ooh, damn. That would be awesome, especially considering Amazing Spider-Man number five. Uh, Doctor Doom is one of the big bads for Spidey and could have derailed that series if he defeats Spider-Man back then. So um, I like that a lot, actually, because Doctor Doom being introduced through Spider-Man would be a way to then eventually introduce the Fantastic Four in the future. Gives you an in. I like it. Uh, well, and and it also it also makes it really easy. Um, you know, you you think back to the '90s when that friendship between Spidey and the Human Torch was so. It was. It was. Anytime Spidey and the Fantastic Four were involved, you always saw how buddy buddy um, him and the in the him and the Human Torch were, and I think it would be really really cool to see that today. Absolutely. And and how that friendship would grow, especially with Tom Holland being the young, like kind of happy go lucky kid. You make your your human torch like maybe a year or two older than Parker. Mm-hmm. So he's kind of got that I have a little more experience than you thing going on. Um but I look I listen to your list. I think about all the characters that have been ad- adapted. The problem is, is that they that Doctor Doom is on that list. He's been adapted before, just not as a villain of Spidey. Um, right. Really, a name that needed to be on that list that's not anywhere in fucking sight. Carnage needs to be on that list. Mm-hmm. In this universe... If you're not going to actually use, uh, what was his name, John Bernthal, as the Punisher, you need to introduce mm-hmm. a Punisher into the Spider-Man universe where his first story is as a bad guy. Makes for a more yep. poignant story when you turn him into a good guy. Uh, All about it. I like the idea of introducing the Jackal, as I said, the Scarlet Spider, uh, and and Ben Riley is fucking awesome that's my favorite spider-man yeah man that's cool uh he's great uh so let me look here what we got on our rundown here i need to see something real fast here oh my gosh that it is what time i think yeah it is what time i think it is because i'm gonna skip that scarlett johansson thing because she's boring i don't want to talk about her anymore (laughs) she said some dumb shit like she should be able to play a tree or a asian and it doesn't matter because acting is literally your acting. It's in the job description. Yeah. And then I, I love that somebody took a picture and uh, it was of a tree. And it just said, I just met Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did not. You did not meet Scarlett Johansson. That did not happen. Okay, Tyler, it's time, my dude. We're going to pull something out of the vault, folks. I can't believe we're finally doing this. So, way back at episode 50 of Journey into Comics, we did this thing called Random Origins. And Random Origins is essentially you Mad Libs the origin of of a comic book character, take out all the important bits, have somebody fill out their stuff, and you, uh, you know, you get an interesting and sometimes funny, I put the quotations there, funny reaction. What I'm going to do now, Tyler, and I didn't say this before, but we're going to do this right before here, is we're going to actually put a little break in here where we're going to let people hear some of the segment of the original Random Origins, I'm going to insert that into the episode here right now. So uh, we'll start with Brandon. You're at the very top, buddy. All right. <clears throat> when Brando was bit by a hairy Wookiee, he gained amazing powers, including regeneration and flight. After the death of his rock, Brando 
woke, woke and decided to use his newfound powers to smash trees. <laughs> <laughs> he is now known as the fucking Noodle Man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, Seek, so whenever you're ready, bro. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> As a child, Seek was involved in an accident, and an ex-girlfriend got his got in his face, causing him to lose his sense of smell. Uh, a plastic surgeon by day, Seek uses the power of being left-handed to fight crime in Rave City. <laughs> While some call him the man without hope, members in the hero community call him Slip Moon. <laughs> um... I'm changing my PlayStation name right now. <laughs> oh, that was fucking amazing. Welcome to the Journey to Comics family, Slipped Moon. Uh, hey, Wes, can you get yours via Skype as well? Uh, let's find out. <laughs> okay. All right, now, what was that, Seek? I said I'm glad to be left-handed now. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Left-handed people are fucking super talented, and I'm not even saying that to, like, stroke you. I'm just being serious. Like, every left-handed person Whoa, I know... Wow. Hey, I'm just being fucking honest. This every left got a lot more erotic. <laughs> Look, when I talked to Seek about coming on the 50th, he told me his nipples would be exposed for tasering. All right, Wes. Take it away, buddy. <laughs> All right. So... A Hoth War 13 veteran who served great or survived great atrocities, Wes was born with his abilities that allow him control over dragons. Following the execution of his sword, <laughs> he adopts the name of Tom as a true <laughs> protector of shark rights. <laughs> he isn't afraid to use any means necessary, including fucking. <laughs> 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 Disciples of his brotherhood of classy dudes call him Spork. <laughs> Blaine, you're up next. Uh, here, dickhole. <laughs> oh, man. After his idols were meddled in front of him, Blaine vowed to protect Phil City. Without any real powers, he uses the limitless amounts of Russians that he has to make dildos <laughs> with... with <laughs> And he has to make dildos with which he fights crime his, and his nemesis, the beach ball. <laughs> and his sidekick, Falcon, Fishman watches over his city, patrolling it in his fishmobile. Wow. wow. <laughs> oh, it was fun. funnier when you read it. <laughs> <laughs> it was. He killed it. All right. That's fantastic. Hook up Rob with his uh, microphone. You're number two on the list, sir. Okay. All right. So, uh, during the experimental detonation of a fluffy alligator, trash man Silent Rob rushes to save Fritz Fitzpatrick, <laughs> absorbing massive amounts of villagers. <laughs> Silent Rob emerges with incredible powers, including ice eyes and laser toes. We know him as Silent Rob, but the world knows him as the Hairy Pitchfork. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So, so far, I think Random Origins is a win. Oh, dude, it's awesome. <laughs> it is awesome. I like it. Oh. <laughs> I do believe I sent Shuddy's origin. All right, did. Shud. It's true. Go All ahead right. and give it to us. All right. After the sideways clown cried on his ball and later in life began oh, being drank. Oh, okay. Sorry. And later in life being drank by a bat. Shuddy Boy was gifted with the ability to control any animal. Like a guardian angel, he protects his city. He is the pot. <laughs> <laughs> and then he smokes himself and dies. The end. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Nick, I'm going to give this to you. You're next. All right. And then I th is that it for the random origin? Oh, fuck. Wait, where am I? <clears throat> Gotcha. Alright. Not much is known about the year in which Nick was born. Historians believe his birth was sometime in ancient Greece. A natural defense brought or screw out of his tits, and he cannot drive. Huh. 
This ability made him the prime candidate for the Chicago in program. This program covered his ass with cars. <laughs> and at the moment Nick died, Butt Viper was born. <laughs> Grammatical error. No, no, no. And at that moment, Nick died, but Viper was born. Butt Viper. Oh, dude. Fucking read. <laughs> I thought it was Butt Viper was my Bud name. Viper. Butt Viper. <laughs> That's a button. That is. <laughs> That's a button. It's officially Butt Viper now. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah no. you're fucking Butt Viper, Butt dude. Butt Viper is a much better name. The last son of the dead planet Squirrel, Nate was rocketed away to Earth as an infant. As Nate grew up, he discovered he had fantastic powers such as punching watermelons and cooking shoes with his middle fingers. What? <laughs> After dating his co-worker at Monstrous Pipe... <laughs> what? Uh, she gave him the name Cowardly Sword. Nate's only weakness is his ball sack, which every one of his villains seems to get their hands on. <laughs> <laughs> so I am now Cowardly Sword. You're now Cowardly Sword. Of, of the uh, Monster Pipe Company. <laughs> Sweet. And we are back from you guys listening to some of the random origins and how some of those went. We hope you enjoyed them. They are hysterical. Now it is time, Tyler. We finally are bringing this back out of the vault. You will now join so many others who have this amazing thing. What I'm going to ask of you now is what I'm going to send you. You will read it. Read it slowly and think about what you are saying as you have given the answers that you are going to see okay. within this question. Okay, so here we go. This is your random origin, Tyler. Take the floor. It is now on your Facebook. Okay. Okay. Tyler was created by the Hammerhead Shark and was the first successful clone of Carol Shelby. <laughs> A previous clone suffered from clone degeneration and was considered unstable. Through arcane science, Tyler is imprinted with a copy of Shelby's arms and, in their first encounter, believed himself to be Shelby. After Tyler was captured by Timberwolf... Both Tyler and Shelby found themselves in Deadpool's cargo shorts at the Florida <laughs> Keys and initially fought each other, believing the other was the imposter. When realizing the stakes, they decided to team up in an attempt to save the Blake Lively clone and a captured Alexander Ludwig. <laughs> in the process, Tyler appeared to be killed in death by glorious combat and Shelby, Fearful of the consequences of a corpse of a second Shelby being found, dropped Tyler's body into a different plane of existence. <clears throat> Tyler survived and escaped from the alternate plane and will be forever known as Yellow Sea Lion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh. That was yeah. good. Yeah, so... You had no idea. I just asked you very, very vague things like male person, female person, animal, different animal, place to go, location. And that's what we got, man. And uh, to peel it back even further, that was actually Ben Riley's Scarlet Spider origin mm -hmm. with all of the details stripped away that you really filled in. It. So, cool, I'm glad, I'm glad. Uh, so now that's, you're forever known as Yellow Sea Lion, my friend. Welcome, welcome. Now we're going to have to get some other people to do the Random Origin. I realize Veronica's never done one. Nick hasn't done one. I'm really, I really want to hear Nick do one. Oh, yeah, N Nick's going to be the next one. We'll, ha we'll, we'll pick a time and we'll have him on the show for Shizzle. Uh... Is there anything else we want to do before we get out of here, my brother? Um, let me look at our agenda real quick. Uh, there was one thing that I forgot to bring up. Um, was it aliens? When we were talking, well, possibly. 
when we were talking about DP, DC stuff... Uh, we weren't talking about DP. Watch no. out now. Watch you sent, out you sent me now. something about Jason Momoa being fat shamed. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you brought this up. So, like, apparently he has been vacationing and chilling off of the success of, you know, Game of Thrones is over and he had to kind of get to ride the wave of that ending. You know, he killed at Aquaman and made a bunch of money for them. And now it's time to kick back with the family and be away from the spotlight, you know. And some pictures uh, popped up of him on vacation. And he still looks damn good. Like, it's best fucking dad bod I've ever seen, if that's what you're going to call it. I mean, I have a more traditional dad bod. Um, but, you know, uh, he looked still fucking ripped. And people were, like, shredding him. Like, oh, where'd your fucking abs go, Aquaman? You know, and, and you know, just being really shitty and people saying awful stuff and just calling him a fat fuck and all these things and just like, way to let yourself go, loser. Now you'll never be Aquaman again and shit like that. Like, what the fuck, dude? The dude is on vacation. Let a motherfucker have a cheeseburger. Jesus Christ. Right. Motherfucker judges my abs. I'm going to piss on their face. I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it, fuck I mean, you. We've talked about it so many times on this show that it's just, like, we as fans are so passionate about everything, and that's great, and that's grand, and keep doing it, but fucking give these actors and actresses a fucking break. Give these directors and producers a break, man. They are not really superheroes. No, they're just people. They're people playing a role that make money from you enjoying the role they're playing. If Jason I mean, Momoa wants, to, if Jason Momoa wants to enjoy himself and pack on some pounds and not hit the gym like six or seven times a day, like let the man relax. Let him eat a motherfucking sandwich. Yes, or two he, of them. Now I'm starting to get hungry. I'm thinking about like food. I'm like, shit. I want a sandwich. Well, I kind of brought this up because Skylar's making dinner right now, and I can not only see it, but I can smell it. Oh, that's delicious. What's for dinner? Taco ring. Say what? Taco ring. What's a taco ring, my friend? It is crescent roll. Okay. With taco filling. Yes. And then you fold the crescent roll back over top of it. Fuck yes. And you bake it in the oven. Fuck and yes. And then, then you cut yourself off juicy taco crescent roll triangles sweet uh that sounds amazing super, super easy to make like stupidly easy to make yeah but it's all you would good. do is like okay this is just me riffing on the what i would do with the recipe so i'd like make ground beef season it with my taco seasoning then i would introduce a blend i would do a little bit of cream cheese sour cream blended together in the taco meat, that way it has like a binding agent. I would roll that up with cheddar cheese under your crescent roll. And then, oh, it's like almost like a pig in a blanket, like a hot dog in a blanket type thing. Mm -hmm. Except for it's a taco. Oh, my God, that sounds fucking flame. Woo! You know what I'm making for dinner <laughs> this week? Got a little week? Ric Flair with it. Jesus. It just dripped down to me. I didn't mean to. It just happens that way. Sometimes you talk about good food, and it just makes me go, God damn. <laughs> yeah, the the simple recipe is just taco meat, mix some cheese into it, put it in the crescent roll. I'll send you a picture of it when it's done. I'm into that. Please send me all your dirty porn pictures of food. Mm -hmm. Of of food is the end of that. Don't Don't just send me. I don't need to. We're friends, but I don't really need to know you on that level. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that. Good, I'm glad. Thanks for, I'm, it, thanks for fat shaming me, Nate. Whoa, no, I wasn't fat shaming you. Oh shit, nope. that's. Nope. I'm not. I'm not attract. I'm not attractive enough for you. No man is attractive enough for me, bro. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I'm saying. Like, oh, no man. offense. I just you know, 
it's like I'm scrolling. You don't want to accidentally see a wiener in your timeline. You're just like, wow, it's a wiener. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, get the man. fuck out of here. Terrifying. All right, folks. Before we get out of here, let's tell you guys where you can check out the Journey into Comics podcast. Obviously, you're listening now, but you can always check us out on all the different social medias. Get us on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, Spotify, CastBox, TuneIn, many others. Just search Journey into Comics Network. Go to journeyintocomics.com or go to patreon.com backslash journey into comics. Give us a dollar for early access, exclusive content. Three dollars if you're a network member and want to give us some dinero. Five dollars if you want a sticker. Ten dollars if you want to talk to me in a private setting about a podcast and want to learn about podcasting, I guess. There's a shirt option. We have all kinds of different shit. Honestly, it's the real deal. Um, I think that w- I'm pretty... I'm like 95% sure that's going to do it this week, Tyler. Do you have anything else to add, my dude? Nope. All right, folks. Well, if that's going to do it this week's for this week's episode of Journey into Comics. This has been Journey into Comics 252. I have been Nate and I've been Tyler. And as always, the folks, the Yellow Sea Lion. Oh yeah, the Yellow Sea Lion. Don't forget it. The Yellow Sea Lion's going to tell you right now to pop your caps back and fill your brains with shit. Later, guys.